Our next speaker is a really great guy. I talked about him in my presentation yesterday because he made such an impact on me when I visited him at the Keck Telescope and we've tried to stay in touch. But Jeff is the uh, professor of astronomy at UC Berkeley and he and his team have found more planets around other stars than anybody else on this planet. And I think they've also found the first uh, smaller planets. You know, the first ones found were very large, but found the first uh, Saturn-sized planet, Neptune-sized planet. And they, uh, there's been something over 200 found, and I think they've found 110 or 100 and something more than that. And he's a humble guy, as you can tell. Look at him right there. <laughs> He's just uh, offered to help us with everything in the whole conference, and he's just been uh, unbelievable. And, and um, you know, he's, he's got a neat new telescope that, uh, that he would like to bring on board. So if any of you are secretly really, really wealthy, it'd be great to help this guy out here. <laughs> so, uh, and Jeff's been, uh, you know, man of the year in Time Magazine and and uh, ABC, Nightly News, CBS, CNN, even David Lever Letterman. So will you please welcome Jeff Marcy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very nice. Well, it, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I, I have to say, I'm uh, a little humbled to be asked to speak here. I'm not sure this is a venue I would normally be invited to, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting, especially Walter, for being courageous enough to invite me here. Um, I'd like to tell you a little about the research my team has been doing for the last uh, 10 years now, and I'll tell you most especially about research we hope to do in the future. Um, let me start with a little history that most of you already know. Some 2,400 years ago, the Greeks sat around uh, cafes on hot summer days uh, wondering what the stars were like, whether there was life elsewhere in the universe. And in fact, the most uh, vociferous proponent of uh, theory uh, about all of this, of course, was Aristotle, who posited that the Earth was at the center of the universe. Everything went around it, including the stars. And he also stated very clearly that there would be no other planets inhabited. So that was the dominant theory for some almost 2,000 years. And I'm going to turn down the volume if I can. Testing. Is that a little better, Jeff? Hasn't Jeff been fantastic organ making everything work this whole meeting? Unbelievable. So the Aristotelian notion lasted literally until uh, the Renaissance, but there were indeed heretics, even in Aristotle's time, who disagreed with him and were outcast. One of them, indeed my favorite, is Democritus, who not only came up with the notion of atoms, but he came up with the idea that there might be other planets. And here's a quote from Democritus. There are innumerable worlds of different sizes, these worlds are at irregular distances, more in one direction, some in another. And he, I love the last part of it, some of the worlds have no animal or vegetable life, nor any water, the suggestion being that other planets do have a such life around them. So that, he was an amazing thinker. And he had a few others who felt similarly. Uh, Epicurus uh, wrote the following, there are infinite worlds, both like and unlike this world of ours. We must believe that in all worlds, there are living creatures and plants and other things that we see in this world. So these were remarkable philosophers of their day without any real hard data uh, suggesting that the Earth was not unique, that there might be other Earth-like planets, and some of them might be inhabited. And that will be the topic of my talk today, how we in the current era are attempting to find other planets and maybe even habitable planets. Now, of course, the backdrop is our own Milky Way galaxy. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies, but our Milky Way is some 100,000 light years across, and it contains, of course, 200 billion 
stars, all more or less like our sun, some less massive, some more massive. And so this offers many opportunities uh, for uh, maybe planets to orbit those stars and perhaps even some of them being uh, habitable. I put a little rotating water molecule to suggest that the laws of physics and chemistry as well as we know them uh, pertain all across the Milky Way galaxy and indeed throughout the universe. So it suggests that the properties of the Earth might be reproduced elsewhere on other planets. So we're attempting to answer a question that has been around a very long time, uh, but we've uh, only started making the smallest amount of progress. And of course, the reason we don't know much about life elsewhere in the universe is that the only firm, strong, convincing evidence of life anywhere in the universe is right here on the Earth. We still to this day don't have clear, incontrovertible evidence. Thanks, Jeff. Tune it down a bit. We still don't have, oh, that's perfect. Uh, we still don't have clear, incontrovertible evidence of life, even bacterial life, elsewhere other than right here on the planet Earth. So we obviously need to embark on a search. And the way we have been searching successfully to find planets is, a, is tricky. We actually can't see the planets around other stars directly, even with the Hubble Space Telescope. They're lost in the glare of the star. So we watch the star. And of course, a star will wobble in space as it's pulled gravitationally by the planet going around it. So we simply watch the star day after day, week after week, month after month, even year after year, to see if the star is stationary, in which case nothing is pulling gravitationally on it, or instead if the star wobbles around because it is being yanked by the attendant planet or planets. So that's the strategy, is to watch the star to infer the presence of planets. And the way we do it is to use the Doppler effect. It's a fairly well-known effect, but I'll just remind you that as a star wobbles around being yanked on by an indeed unseen planet that's orbiting around out here somewhere, that wobbling star will send light waves, as it normally does, to us at the Earth, and the light waves will alternately compress and stretch and compress and stretch as this Doppler effect uh, does its thing with the star approaching us and receding away from us, just as a, a train whistle changes its pitch when the train approaches you on the tracks and recedes. Ooh, so we see the Doppler effect in light. So this is very straightforward, and we're going to use that to try to find uh, planets around other stars. Now, of course, one question you might ask right away is whether or not we might be able to detect from afar, Alpha Centauri, I say, our own planets in our own solar system. What would our sun look like? Would it wobble due to the planets that go around the sun? And the answer is yes, our sun certainly does wobble. Uh, here's a graph of the velocity of our sun over the course of time, starting in 1960, 1970, all the way up to 2020. And you can see that our sun indeed does not have a constant velocity. The velocity of our sun increases, decreases. It's coming at you and away from you, as seen from Alpha Centauri or Tau Ceti or whatever. And of course, that wobble is due to the planets yanking on the sun uh, every day throughout the year and decades. And in fact, the biggest signal, this si near sinusoid from one peak to the next, is primarily due to the biggest bully in our solar system, Jupiter. So in fact, you see a nice 12-year periodicity in our sun's motion due to the big bully. And if you look carefully, you see there's an outer envelope. The sine curve is high and then low and then high. That's due to the next biggest bully, Saturn, in our solar system. And if you could measure this very carefully, you could see the wobble of our sun due to even smaller planets like the Earth, although the Earth makes a very tiny effect. So that's the, the game plan to find um, s planets like those in our solar system, but around other stars. Now, of course, to carry out actual measurements of the Doppler effect of other stars, I, I've in, enlisted wonderful collaborators, and I've used some of the world's biggest telescopes. So let me introduce you to both of those. First, um, my collaborators, Paul Butler, has been working with me for about 20 years. 
Um, Deborah Fisher is a professor of astronomy at San Francisco State University. And Dr. Uh, Stephen Vogt is an optical expert at UC Santa Cruz. He builds the spectrometers, the telescopes, lenses, the cameras that we use in our research. So without these three, who frankly do way more work than I do, we wouldn't be able to find any planets at all. The, the telescopes that we use are also remarkable. In Northern California, there's Lick Observatory. In the Southern Hemisphere, giving us access to the Southern Hemispheric stars, we use the Anglo-Australian Telescope in Australia. And then we're lucky enough to use, uh, in the University of California system, the world's largest telescope, uh, the Keck Telescope. It's located, if you haven't been there, on the big island of Hawaii, high atop a uh, hopefully dormant volcano called Mauna Kea. <laughs> And so it's a marvelous, almost sacred place, you would say, uh, because of the native Hawaiians' uh, love of that uh, mountaintop at 14,000 feet, and sacred also for scientists who do this wonderful uh, cosmological work there. So that's the game plan, but now there's one more element that I have to introduce you to, and that is to measure the Doppler effect, we have to spread the white light out from the star into all of its composite colors, blue, green, yellow, and red. And you could do that with a prism. We use a very fancy prism called a spectrometer, essentially the same thing. The eyepiece of the telescope would be up here. Instead, we let the starlight come through the telescope and into the spectrometer, where it's spread out into all of its composite colors, or wavelengths of light. And we record it with a digital camera. So here's what we actually see at the Keck telescope. Um, every five or ten minutes when we're, we close the shutter, the, the light stops coming through and we, we record on the computer um, the spectrum of colors from another star. Now, if that star has a planet, the planet will yank gravitationally on the star and cause a Doppler effect. And here's what that Doppler effect looks like. If we come back, let's say, a week later or a month later, we see this, a shift in the spectrum. If we come back another month or two later, perhaps another shift, and, and another shift, showing the star is not stationary, it's changing its velocity. And moreover, if the planet then turns the corner, the star will be yanked in the other direction. And this should continue on and on and on, over and over again, uh, in a periodic way, due to the fact that the planet simply keeps going around the star essentially forever and ever. So that's the game plan, to look for a periodic and reproducible Doppler shift that's, that you can go back a year later and see the same effect again. Now, I'd like to show you some real data um, sh of this Doppler effect. And here's a star that um, many of you have seen. You can see it with your naked eye. It's star 16 in the constellation Cygnus. And we've been measuring its velocity, as you see here. These are units of meters per second. Over the course of the last, oh, decade or more, so here's 1994 all the way to 2006. And when we go to the telescope, we make a single measurement of the Doppler effect. We come back maybe a week later, make another measurement. And back in 1993, we started observing Cygni. And let me show you the first three data points taken way back then. There they are. So in 1993, we took three measurements. Each dot represents a different Doppler measurement. If you have good eyes, you can see the uncertainty in our measurement. There's the error bar. So if you look carefully, you can see that these velocities are nearly at the same velocity level. One point is a little bit higher than the others, which makes you a little suspicious. Maybe the velocity of the star is changing. So we came back the next year and made a few more measurements. And now you can see that within the error bars, the data points, the Doppler shift, has changed, the star seemed to wobble, and then it came back. So obviously, we've been monitoring this star for the last 10 years very intently. Let me now show you the whole next decade of Doppler measurements. And what you can see is that you can almost connect the dots like a kindergartner would do. The, the data points go up, and then the star com, comes down in velocity, and then the velocity goes up and comes down, up and down. This is just going to repeat forever for literally billions of years, I have absolutely no doubt. And if you have good eyes, you can read off on this graph the period of the star's wobble, which of course is the same as the planet's orbital period as it goes around the star. That period from one peak to the next is about two years. You can see it by eye, a little more than two years. 
So that tells you right away there's a planet going around the star that takes about 2.2 years. Now, by the way, if there were a brown dwarf or another star orbiting this star, you would see a very similar effect. It's just that the amplitude would be much, much larger because, of course, a massive brown dwarf or a star or a black hole would yank very strongly on this star gravitationally. So we would see a much bigger effect. The actual effect we see, this wobble amplitude, is only about 50 meters per second. And you can use standard laws of physics and immediately deduce the mass of the planet that can yank on a star, causing a 50 meter per second wobble of the star. And that mass turns out to be about 70% bigger than Jupiter. This is a planet bigger than our own Jupiter. Um, not surprising that our universe would contain some planets bigger than even the biggest planet in our own solar system. So that's not too surprising. And frankly, we've found about 100 planets somewhat like this already. Jupiter-sized, Saturn-sized planets, the biggest planets, they stand out like a sore thumb. 80% of our stars show no signal at all, no evidence of a planet. So a large fraction of the stars that you see in the night sky don't have a Jupiter or a Saturn. Now there's one other thing about these data that you probably are noticing. It should make you squirm in your seats a little bit. And that's that the velocity of the star went up gently, but then the star's velocity was jerked downward to a lower velocity in just a few weeks. And then it took two years for the star's velocity to increase, and then the star was jerked again quickly down to a lower velocity. Why should that be? Well, there's a very easy explanation, and it's that the planet's orbit is not a circle around the star, but instead the orbit is elliptical, elongated. And you can build a computer model of such an orbit. And here it is. There's the star 16 Cygni b. Here's the planet that we've modeled on the computer. You see the orbit goes like this. The planet goes around going quickly when it's close to the star, and then more slowly when it's far out, taking 2.2 years to do one whole dance. By the way, for reference, here's our solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. You can see that this orbit, we can compute its size and its shape, the egg shape that you see, and of course, as I said, the mass of the planet quite precisely, with almost no ambiguity. The one thing we can't learn at all is what the planet looks like. We don't know its color, its chemical composition, if it's gaseous or rocky. So we have to guess at that point, we, and we actually don't know the answers. Um, the best guess is that a planet bigger than Jupiter might look like a big, fat Jupiter. Um, and so we've used uh, some artist license, and Lynette Cook has painted this rendering of the 16 Cygni planet. Probably, but we don't know for sure, the planet is gaseous, hydrogen and helium gas, no rocky surface to stand on, just like our own Jupiter and Saturn. Maybe there are moons orbiting uh, the giant planets we're finding. After all, all of the giant planets in our solar system have moons, so perhaps giant planets elsewhere also have such moons, and this planet would go around and around. Because it comes close to the host star, any water that might reside on the moon would certainly evaporate and literally escape the moon. So there's no chance of water being retained, at least on the surface, of any moon that came so close to its host star. So that tells you something about habitability. Neither this gaseous planet, if indeed it is gaseous, nor this icy, rocky moon could really have standing liquid water on their surfaces. Now, we found many other types of planets, and I just want to tell you about two others. Here is um, a, a, a bit of a Rosetta Stone. You see the data. This is velocity over the course of time again. And I'm showing you the actual data points. Hasn't been fudged at all. Each dot represents another measurement at the Keck telescope of the Doppler effect. And you can again connect the dots. And you see that the velocity goes up and down and up and down and up and down and so on. And we've published these results. But if you look carefully, you can see that the velocities, sure, they go up and down. But there's an envelope, a superimposed longer period variation where the velocities go up and then down, and then starting up again. And you can then decompose the two wobbles that your eye sees. Here's the shorter period wobble, and then the longer period wobble. You add these two together, and you get the data that we actually detect up there. So this is a star that simply has two planets. Not entirely surprising, but it's quite wonderful to realize that 
there are multi-planet systems out there, just as our sun has multiple planets. We've found two systems now, two stars, that have four planets going around them. So it's quite exciting that as time goes on, we're finding stars that harbor more and more planets, also lower and lower mass ones as our techniques get better and better. So this is pretty exciting. Now I'd like to introduce you finally to one last star that is um, indeed often termed a Rosetta Stone in planetary science. It's the star Gliese 876. It's a small star, about a third the mass of our sun, um, but we discovered very early on that it has two Jupiters, like the last case that I showed you, and I will show you the data in a second. Moreover, these two Jupiters have orbital periods of 30 days, and the other one 60 days, actually 61 days, almost exactly in the ratio of two to one. And in fact, as these planets go around each other, they pull gravitationally, not just on the star, causing it to wobble, but the planets pull gravitationally on each other. And that causes an amazing effect, indeed precession, in this system. So let me show you the data. Um, this is rather dry, but I like to show the real data points. Here's the velocity again of the star. Over the course of time, this is Julian date, so it's, it's our own separate kind of units, but you're seeing about 12 years of data here. And you see the data points do indeed go up and down due to one planet. This funny envelope here shows you immediately that there's two planets. A single planet wouldn't do that. So there are clearly two planets here. We've built a computer model just as before. Here's the star, inner planet taking 30 days to go around an outer planet taking about 61 days to go around. And they, of course, line up. Every two orbits of the inner planet and every one orbit of the outer planet, they line up again. It's an amazing resonance in which, in fact, gravity between the planets enforces the resonance. If one planet got a little bit ahead, the gravity from the other planet would pull it back into alignment. So these two planets will stay in a two to one ratio of their orbital periods for billions of years. There's almost no way around it. So it's a very exciting clockwork-like planetary system. And here's what it looks like in action. Computer model, you see the two planets lining up every 60 days, they line up again. But if you watch carefully, you see what's happening is that the major axis uh, along which the ellipses are oriented is slowly turning, it's rotating, and this is indeed precession. This whole um, orientation of the two ellipses is slowly uh, arcing around, and it will take about nine years for this whole thing to go around once. Obviously, it's being sped up here. So in nine years, the entire planetary system goes through one full precession cycle. This is seen in our data incontrovertibly, and obviously the computer models using standard physics reproduces this as well. Many different scientists have tried to shoot each other down, but they all get the same answer. So that's pretty exciting, um, but there's more. And it turns out that these two planets not only yank on each other, causing precession, but those two planets don't entirely explain the data that we get. And if we subtract, then, the predicted motion of the planets and look at what velocities are left over, the velocity residuals, here's what we see. So these are the velocities left over after we've subtracted that effect of the two Jupiters. And over the course of time, and indeed you're only seeing about five days here, there is a, yet a third planet that takes about 1.9 days to go around its star. So very quickly, every 1.9 days, this planet, this inner planet, goes around the star that already has two Jupiters. So it's a very exciting system. Uh, somebody sent me a letter telling me he had a mathematical proof that there was no intelligent life on this um, inner planet that takes 1.9 days. And he said, I I'm, I'm reading his letter, and he said, here's my proof. He said, what intelligent species would want to pay income taxes every 1.9 days? <laughs> But the exciting thing about this system is that, of course, it's very low mass. You see how ugly the data look. The, the signal is hardly bigger than our errors. We're just barely able to detect this, and it took about five years of collecting more and more data points for this to emerge. But the planet has only seven and a half uh, times the mass of our Earth. It's the lowest mass planet yet found, 
and we're very excited about it, but even more so because we probably can improve our Doppler errors, make them smaller, and thereby detect even lower mass planets approaching that mass of the Earth. So that's exciting. Here's an artist's sketch of the system. There's the star, Gliese 876. There's the inner Jupiter, the outer Jupiter that I talked about first. And here's this seven and a half Earth mass planet that, that goes around every 1.9 days. Uh, the little movie showing you, there's the, the outer Jupiter uh, zipping by it as you would see it in a spaceship, uh, the middle Jupiter. And then if you look carefully in silhouette, you'll see the, the Earth-like planet very close to the star. All, of course, an artist's rendering, but it's, it's quite, we suspect that it's fairly accurate, except we really have no idea what the composition of this inner planet is. Is it rocky? Is it gaseous? Is it a combination like Neptune with a rocky core and a gaseous or liquid envelope? We really don't know. It's so close to the star that tides would be raised on it, probably distending the planet, uh, distorting it so that any friction inside would heat up the planet perhaps heating it up so much that there would be volcanism on the surface, who knows, geysers, and so on. So this is a mysterious planet, which obviously someday we would hope to get an actual picture of it uh, and maybe a spectrum of it, but right now we don't, we don't have that. So let's put all the pieces together. Milky Way galaxy, 200 billion stars. Our survey has shown that some 10% of those stars that we've surveyed have planets, albeit the largest of the planets. So that tells you right away that 10% of the stars in our galaxy have planetary systems, and multiply the two numbers, and you get 20 billion planetary systems just within our Milky Way alone. This is almost certainly a lower limit, a minimum, because we can only detect the Jupiters and Saturns and Neptunes so far. But there are at least 10 billion planetary systems just within our galaxy, and then of course there are hundreds of billions of galaxies out there in the universe, all somewhat similar to our Milky Way. So the number of planetary systems in our universe is, is almost uncountable. Now of course we've only found the biggest planets, what about the Earth-like planets? Can we hope to guess or even maybe detect Earth-like planets? And not only that, can we find Earth-like planets that would have lukewarm temperatures making them habitable? Well, that's a key question. And the habitability of an Earth-like planet is, is, is tricky and controversial. Here's the most basic idea about habitability, and then I'll tell you some other ideas. Here's a star, and here are three, uh, it's a cartoon, obviously, of three rocky planets. Now, of course, if a planet is too close to its host star, it receives too much uh, sunlight, starlight, from that uh, star, and so the planet heats up to be too hot. On the other hand, if a planet, that's of course the case for Mercury and Venus. If a planet is too far away from the host star, it doesn't receive enough uh, radiation from the star, and of course it then turns out to be too cold, as is the case for Mars and the, the Jovian moons, Saturn's moons, and so on. And of course what we're hoping to find are Earth-like planets, rocky planets, that have a temperature that, um, well, to quote Goldilocks, uh, is uh, just right. And so that's really the, the f most basic attribute of a planet to render it habitable. It has to have the right temperature. But the question really has now arisen, what other attributes of a planet are necessary in order for it to support life, at least as we know it? And one way to answer this question about other habitable requirements is to go to the least hospitable place on the Earth. And I think one of the least hospitable places, I is the wonderful National Park Yellowstone. In Yellowstone, of course, there are boiling geysers as well as boiling hot springs. In the winter, it's not just hot, but there's 10 feet of snow on the ground, frigid in Wyoming. And to, to top it all off, the water that comes out of the geysers and hot springs is highly acidic. Now, the biologist had told me about this, and I just wanted to see it for myself. So, And you can all do this as well. Go to Yellowstone, bring some pH uh, paper with you and measure the acidity of the water yourself. Here's a hot spring. I'll show you in a second uh, measuring the pH. Notice the different colors coming of, off of the hot spring. The water is boiling at the hot spring itself and then it winds its way, losing heat, cooling off, uh, and so each of the streamlines you see represents water at a slightly different temperature, several degrees different. And amazingly, these colors that you see 
not due to minerals, they're due to different bacteria that thrive in a certain niche of temperature. So each one of those different colors represents a different species of bacterium that can only thrive in a, a range of a few degrees temperature. It's, you see this all over Yellowstone. Um, and then, of course, on top of this, the water is extraordinarily acidic, so I was told you can check it, bring some pH paper, uh, like an amateur biologist, dunk the pH paper into the water. You see the different colors right there. And here you see that the pH clearly is about 2, which is very, very acidic, battery acid level acidity. And yet you see this wonderful filamentous bacteria is actually growing there in that boiling acidic water. The message is certainly clear that life can thrive in conditions that we would normally consider inhospitable. And here's my favorite hot spring at Yellowstone, Churning Cauldron. You can walk right up to it, as you see we did, um, brought our pH paper. But look at how frightening this boiling cauldron is. I didn't dare stick my, my finger even near that water with the pH paper attached, lest maybe neither the pH paper nor my finger came out. So I attached the pH paper to a metal clip. You see this nice black clip. And then I tied the clip to a string, and I tossed the whole thing into churning cauldron and let it stay there for 20 seconds and then reeled it out as if I were a fisherman. And here's what I saw. Here's the pH paper. Again, it came out pH 2. So it's not only boiling. You see it in the background, but, but it's acidic. And look at the clip. Corroded after 20 seconds. And then here was the thing that almost embarrassed me, as if to laugh in our human faces. There was algae stuck to the string, drawn up, <laughs> happily thriving, probably would, would hate it if the temperature were down to 50 Celsius. Uh, but instead, this 60 or 70 degrees Celsius water is just exactly what this particular algae likes. And many, many bacteria, species of bacteria, thrive in these hot conditions. These extremophiles actually die if the temperature drops below uh, 60 degrees Celsius. So there are many species that are giving us a message. They can't talk, but they're sending us a, a marvelous message, which is that life uh, can thrive in a wide range of temperatures, wider than we might have imagined, acidic, alkaline conditions. They can get their food sources from sulfur. They don't need oxygen necessarily. And they don't even need light. They can thrive under uh, a mile of rock uh, anywhere in the world as long as there's a little liquid water. And that's the key. If there's some liquid water, at least primitive life, bacterial life, thrives. The message is clear that elsewhere in the universe, if you can find a rocky planet that has liquid water, it almost doesn't matter the chemical composition of that planet there's a good chance that life can thrive as long as the temperature allows the water to be in liquid form. So if primitive life is easy to cook up in the cauldron, what about intelligent life? What are the chances that there's intelligent life out there? Can we estimate the, the probability in some kind of mathematical or scientific way, estimate the probability that there's intelligent life? Well, um, you can guess, but here's a little uh, calculation that is about as good as you can do. There are 20 billion planetary systems in our Milky Way, as I already said. Half of them, of course, are older than the Earth. Earth is only 4.6 billion years old. The galaxy is 10 billion years old. So something like roughly half of the star systems and their planets are much older, millions and billions of years older than our own Earth. And so you can ask, what fraction of these 20 billion planetary systems have a planet that harbors not just any old life, but intelligent life? Nobody knows the answer. There's really no clear answer to this question. The most pessimistic answer I've ever heard anyone say, Frank Drake articulates this quite often, is that maybe intelligent life is one in a million. What if it's a one in a million shot? Well, if it's one in a million, then you multiply one in a million by 20 billion planetary systems just in our galaxy alone. And that tells you there must be thousands of civilizations, many of which are older than us, so they would have a technology, presumably, or could have a technology advanced, maybe extraordinarily advanced compared to us. Others may be more primitive. Who knows? So that's the backdrop. The assumption, the conclusion you come to, it's very simplistic. Either this is not solid evidence at all. It's only a mere uh, a sort of a sketch of a calculation, is that our galaxy might harbor over the course of you know, 
ten, its 10 billion year history, it might have thousands of civilizations that are advanced within it. This, of course, is not news. The science fiction writers, the, the filmmakers have known about this kind of a calculation for over a century. And so the science fiction writers, of course, are way ahead of us and have been portraying the nature, plausible or not, of advanced civilizations in the science fiction novels and, and movies that we watch. And so the suggestion is that the universe is teeming with intelligent life. And indeed, maybe our galaxy is, in te is teeming with intelligent life. But if so, it's a little surprising to me. Yeah, maybe there's shreds of evidence of advanced civilizations that came and went or something, but why aren't they here now? Why are they avoiding us? Why isn't there any more clear evidence, an obelisk on the moon? Why isn't there a, a, a camera on Mars, a big uh, observatory watching us here on the Earth? Or indeed, why wouldn't they have noticed how lovely the Earth is? What a Shangri-La of a planet we live on wouldn't they have come and set up uh, hotel resorts and golf courses and uh, you know vacation spots? Why not? For billions of years, we weren't here, so they could just come and visit. And but there's no evidence that there's you know no clear evidence anyway of existing alien golf courses here on the Earth. So there's a problem. Also, robotically, they could be sending robotic spacecraft all over the galaxy. They could be orbiting the Earth just as we are sending probes to Jupiter, Saturn, and beyond they would do the same thing. So it's a little puzzling that the aliens are not ob more obvious than they are. And one possibility that never gets talked about is that it is possible that there are fewer advanced civilizations than I just said. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe advanced technological civilizations are a bit more of a rarity. And here's how that could happen. We expect a thousand civilizations over billions of years, but they better last, if there's only a thousand of them, they better last for a few millions of years for one civilization to overlap the next one that comes along, and the next one, and the next one. If the typical lifetime of a civilization is no more than a million years in an advanced state, then they won't overlap. And you'll, you'll take a snapshot of the galaxy, and at any moment there might be two or three advanced civilizations, uh, but, but perhaps no more. So one issue that we homo sapiens obviously face is to try to last long enough. And we are just scratching at the surface. We've only been technological for a, a few hundreds or thousand years or so, depending on how you define it. But we better last millions of years to have a chance to overlap other civilizations. So it's possible that it's our own finite lifetimes and that of technological beings in general that makes it hard for us to find each other. So to remind you, habitable planets are probably common, and that means we should be looking for habitable Earths, and NASA is going to try to help us. So we've, uh, th we've, there are many teams working with NASA to try to build terrestrial planet finding telescopes. And there's three of them that are fantastic that I'd like to tell you about if you haven't heard about them. Kepler, the Space Interferometer, and the Terrestrial Planet Finder. All three are space-borne telescopes that are specifically designed to detect Earth-like planets in the habitable zones of those stars. That's the good news, that we have the technology to do this. The bad news is that in the last year, actually less than the last year, NASA has, for some reason, changed its mind. And it's decided to turn its attention away from these missions. These last two have been cut to the bone. There's almost no budget for them at all this year for the first time. Kepler survives and should launch in 2008 or 2009, but it frankly is the least exciting of the three missions. It'll only detect the dimming of stars as an Earth crosses in front. We won't get any pictures of the planets. So it's unfortunate that NASA has changed its attention. Uh, the idea, of course, is to send humans back to the moon again. Um, and I'm not sure what the scientific justification for that is. I can't find one yet. There are geopolitical reasons why we want to show our U.S. superiority to the world that, oh, we, we went back to the moon again. But um, there, it's, it's, it's a choice that's affecting the budget of NASA and science in general. So we've decided to build our own telescope to try to find Earth-like planets. It's much harder to do it from the ground, but we have a technique that will work. 
And the idea is uh, that we're doing in conjunction with both UC Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz is to build a dedicated telescope, a telescope that we can use not just um, you know, once a month, like I was telling you, but 365 nights a year and detect the tiny wobbles of stars due to very tiny Earth-like planets. And here's the, the, the design of the telescope. Um, uh, this is the dome. You see the telescope mirror inside here. It would be the same size as Hubble, 2.4 meters across. Hubble-sized telescope, albeit on the Earth. Um, we've started building it. Here it is in Northern California. Uh, last winter, the dome was nearly finished at, at Lake Observatory. You see other domes in the background. This is San Jose back here in the, the hills just before the Pacific Ocean. So we're excited that the dome is coming along. Uh, a few weeks ago, I took another picture. It's almost, it's basically finished now. The dome rotates and moves under computer control. It's all done. This was about uh, $1.5 million, the dome itself, completely robotic. Um, we're also building the telescope. It's almost finished. Here it is. Um, this is me, and here's the project manager, Matt Radovan. Uh, we're checking the quality of the telescope. The mirror will be, as I say, Hubble Space Telescope sized. And this thing is going to be inside the dome, working every night, 365 nights a year. The only thing we need uh, is the spectrometer to spread the light out into all of its colors. And we've designed one, but we don't quite have enough money to finish building it. Here's the design, specially for high precision Doppler shift work. Um, it will be athermalized, insensitive to temperature changes, very high reflectivity optics, um, high spectral resolution, very uh, mechanically stable. And it will achieve a precision of one meter per second. So when we're done with this telescope and the spectrometer, uh, we'll be able to tell you if a star is walking at this speed toward you uh, or this speed away from you, even though the star is 100 light years away. We'll be able to tell you what the speed of the star to within human walking speed. So we're pretty excited by it. And we just need a little more money uh, to finish this. Well, a lot more money, actually, a half a million dollars. But um, that's all that we need. And we're pretty we're, we're psyched up about this. Finding the first Earth-like planets and indeed habitable planets would be a neat achievement for humanity. Here's our simulation of what the telescope would do. You have to simulate what a planet would look like in this telescope. We only measure the Doppler shift. So here I've simulated on the computer the wobble of a star that has a 10 Earth mass planet, hypothetical planet, 10 times the mass of the Earth with an orbital period of 50 days. Such a planet would be closer into its star than the Earth is from the sun, um, but the, so the temperature would be higher, some 80 degrees Celsius. Here on the Earth, it's you know, 10 or 20 degrees Celsius. So that's fine. You see the wobble clearly. Here's velocity over the course of a half a year. You see the star wobble up and down and up and down and up and down. Notice the noise, the points jitter up and down in here. That's the one meter per second errors that I've included in the simulation. So I've added the uncertainties that we will in fact endure in our work. And nonetheless, the wobble will be very clear. So a 10 Earth mass planet, a planet 10 times the mass of the Earth, no trouble detecting it. We use a Fourier technique to be sure that this periodicity is real. And here's what that Fourier technique reveals. It shows you power over the course of prospective orbital periods that you're not sure of yet. And you see this enormous power at a period of 50 days, which is exactly what we put into the computer model. So our analysis technique in the Fourier domain will immediately pick out, which is obvious to the eye, the 50-day periodicity. Now, what if we didn't have the telescope for a whole year? What if we couldn't observe every night? What if we observed for only a few weeks straight? Well, you can see that with just 50 days of data, that's not a periodic wobble. This is just a little piece of, of change of velocity. So you can see how valuable it is to observe a star night after night for at least a whole summer or maybe even a whole year to see the signal repeat over and over. And you can come back next year, and anybody else with their telescope can also observe this star and check to see if we're right or not. Now, finally, what about smaller planets, planets the size of Earth? Here's a simulation of a planet two times the mass of the Earth. Velocity over the course of time, now the signal looks very weak, understandably. A two Earth mass planet barely yanks on its host star. The periodicity, maybe if you squint and have a good imagination, you can see the periodicity, but it's not very clear. Let's do a Fourier analysis of this. The peak comes out. 
but it's not great. This is a pretty strong peak. You get the wrong period, 53 days, not 50. It's not too bad, but it's understandable. You might not quite get the right answer, given that the planet has such a low mass. There's noise in here, too. But the suggestion is very clear that with our new planet, we will be able to find rocky planets with a hard surface at lukewarm temperatures, allowing liquid water to persist in puddles, lakes, and oceans on the surface. So that will be pretty exciting. And now, of course, the question that I'll, I'll, I'll ask and try to answer at the very end here is, so what? What if you find an Earth-like planet? Will, every, will anybody really care? And moreover, what do you do next? You found an Earth-like planet, what to do? Well, the answer is you should now try to figure out if there's any advanced civilization on that planet. It's a long shot, but you should try. And the way to try is to point radio telescopes and any other kind of telescope you have at that Earth-like planet. And luckily enough, uh, Paul Allen at Microsoft has uh, contributed $25 million toward a new radio telescope array being built by the SETI Institute and UC Berkeley. It will be located just north of Mount Lassen at a place called Hat Creek. And there, that radio telescope array will stare at all the 200 billion stars in the galaxy looking for intelligent radio and television signals from any advanced civilizations. The advantage, of course, that we can offer them is that instead of just pointing at any old star, we will be able to tell them which habitable planets to point at and stare for hours and days building up the signal and the signal-to-noise ratio so that perhaps they can pick up even small signals from radio and television transmitters of those habitable planets. If we could someday pick up the reruns from another habitable world of their version of I Love Lucy, we would immediately know that there's no intelligent life on that planet <laughs> at all. Um, so we're getting closer to answering this question. We, we know that the ingredients for life are abundant. The, the petri dishes are there. The ingredients of the petri dishes, the mixer is there, the, 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 the water. Of course, there's plenty of sources of energy all over the universe. And so we're, we're getting closer to answering the question as to whether life might be common. We still have some outstanding questions. Is water really necessary for life? Is DNA the only replicating molecule that can code for life? Or are there other molecules that can code for life? And most poignantly, um, while there might be a lot of primitive life, is intelligence a normal uh, out, a byproduct of evolution? Is intelligence common or rare? And so we really don't know the answer to that. It would be wonderful to find out if it's true. And we can only hope that sometime in our lifetimes, maybe we'll find evidence of intelligent life, or, or maybe we'll only go halfway, find some quasi-intelligent life forms out there. So I'll stop there. Thanks.